Because after all, if God ain't going to do it, maybe I got to. And how many of you know, listen, when it comes to the promises of God, when you seek to help God out, you usually, almost always, probably always, end up with an Ishmael. Ishmaels will cost you more than you're willing to pay. And they will stay with you and agonize you and terrorize you day after day. But an Ishmael is an instant answer to a promise that God seems to be delaying on. Hmm. I hope I can preach this the way I've been meditating on it all week. They seem, Asaph says, seem. Everyone say seem. One of the things that we'll learn as we get older, you ought not to envy people that seem to have it all because most of the time what they have is a heavy debt load. Huh? I've envied people only to find out they're one payment away from losing. And I might have been driving a 1991 Nissan pickup truck that was uglier than sin, but baby, it was paid for. <laughs> they seem to live such painless lives. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They don't have troubles like other people. Can any of you relate? They don't have troubles like other people. And other, he's saying they don't have troubles like me. They're not plagued with problems like everyone else. They wear pride like a jeweled necklace and they clothe themselves with cruelty. These fat cats have everything their hearts could wish for. You can imagine Asaph from the choir loft of the tabernacle watching the apathy of God's people. How he sang the songs because either they were singing one of David's old hits or singing one of David's new hits. But they were giving it all they got and the people of God could seem to care less. And Asaph watched and he thought, why should I be passionate? When they're not. And then when he went out onto the streets, he began to see, I can't pay for the fig. Today that would be the iPhone. And here's somebody not serving God and he buys a whole basket of figs. God, what's up with this? And as, as, as Asaph began to observe this, the, this dichotomy between serving God and the promises of God and looking at people who could care less about God and they seem to have it all there was an internal struggle that was so strong it almost took him out of church almost everyone say this with me we ain't losing our young people verse 6 he goes on they wear pride like a jeweled necklace and they clothe themselves with cruelty. There has always been in every generation that problem. As if we're having to, to juggle the spiritual and the natural. The Christian and the carnal. Holiness with having fun. Giving with getting. Serving with being served. Y'all follow me? And there's so much, and this is what I want to say because we'll see that this was the answer later on, that S Brother Hagen used to always say this, that in the church, we always seem to like to get in one ditch or the other. Where the truth, Brother Hagen used to say, is always in the middle of the road. And we discover in the church, we got some churches, they focus only on the afterlife, right? 
I mean, the only song, I've been in their churches. The only time they get happy is when they sing, won't we be happy over there, over there, or won't we? And what they're saying is, I ain't never going to be happy here. Because here, the devil stole my lunch, killed my cats, my dog ran away. Doom, despair, agony on me, whoa. And that's, that's, that's their theology. I've been in their churches. I remember one time I was preaching in one of their churches. And I got up and I said something along the lines of, y'all are only happy about heaven. But if you read the end of the book, you'll discover you ain't staying there. He's going to send you right back here to the place you've been trying. I never went back to that church. Because all they want to do is die and go to heaven. Well, listen, there's something. Listen, young people. Your teens, your 20-somethings, your 30-somethings, they ain't that interested in eternity. Because they're still immortal, invincible. They ain't never going to die. I know I was like that when I was 20. I did things that if my mama had seen it, she would have killed me because I didn't die in doing it. I mean, when you're immortal, you jump off of buildings. You don't think about eternity because you're just trying to build your life. Right? So if we're one of those churches that all we do is talk about dying, won't we be happy when we die? Young people are going, dude, I just want to live. And so they leave. But then we have the other churches. It's all about now. It's about bigger cars. We used to say bigger cars and VCRs. Now it's LEDs and DVDs, SUVs. But whatever, if we focus only on this life, then our young people, when they encounter a trial, they go, that ain't what the church told me. The church told me if I give, I was going to get a hundredfold return tomorrow. And so when they encounter the trials, they think, well, this ain't working, so they, they leave. So if we're this or we're that, people grow disenfranchised. The promises of God have to do with this life. Make no mistake about it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and he will add these things to you. The rich young ruler bore evidence of it when Jesus said, follow me. The rich young ruler had a hard time following Jesus because he had so much stuff, right? The way he got that stuff is he admitted, I have kept the rules since I was a young man. In obeying God, his obedience made him rich. I have said this before, you'll never be poorer through obedience. Obedience pays disobedience cost. But we may not get what we want when we want. Can I, can I meddle just a little bit? Can I, and I'm just, listen, I'm just going to expose myself in this. It'd be much funner to expose you. But more honest to expose me. Many years ago when my wife and I were missionaries in Europe and we were traveling all throughout Europe and preaching and that was wonderful. But we were receiving invitation after invitation to go to Asia and go to Africa and we were receiving all these invitations to preach in other places of the world and I love traveling. And, and the problem was we always had enough to pay our bills where we were but we didn't have the money to go take advantage of these opportunities. And the opportunities kept coming in, but we couldn't go. And so we began to pray about it, my wife and I. And we were like, God, we don't understand this. We keep getting these invitations, but we can't go. And then one day, it, it, sometimes it's hard to be married to an intercessor. You can relate, can't you, bro? It's amazing how often the Holy Spirit sounds just like Deborah. She came out of prayer one day, and she said, she said, Love, the Lord spoke to me, and I know why we don't have the finances to go pursue these opportunities I said why she said the Lord said to me I can't read I want you to hear this I can't release to you all the money I have ordained for you because if I did Jimmy wouldn't stop to ask me where to go he would just go that wasn't a compliment by the way what God was saying is Jimmy's too childish to handle money because if, no, if he had everything I've ordained for him, he would just be running around like a madman and hurt himself. 
He wouldn't rest. He wouldn't stop. He wouldn't listen. He would just go, 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 go. So the only way God could control me was to restrain me. And before you say amen, you ought to say oh me because there's some reasons why you don't have everything God's promised you. Because God said he gave, listen, God promised the children of Israel the promised land. He said, I'm going to bring you into a land that's so great. You're going to live in houses you didn't build. You're going to drink of wells you didn't dig. You're going to eat of vineyards you didn't plant. This is an amazing place. And everyone was like, glory to God. I want to live wealthy and not work for it. That's awesome, God. Hallelujah. But then he says, I'm going to give you the land a little by a little. Wait, whoa, whoa. That ain't what you promised me. God said, listen, I'm going to give it to you little by little. Because if I gave it to you all at once, everything is going to overgrow. The animals are going to be unattended. You're just not capable of handling it all. So I'm going to give it to you as you can handle it. So in our natural life, you and I got to understand, if God's made us promises that we don't have yet, Maybe we need to develop ourselves so we can handle it. Right? Are y'all listening to me? So the promises of God, God, listen, God has not ordained his children to misery. God has not blessed poverty. God does not ordain sickness. He don't. And I don't care what your theology is and I don't care how many PhDs said it. It's untrue. God is not the author of sickness. I am the Lord that not that inflicts thee (sighs) but if we don't have everything he promised we got to say Lord what do I need to do what training do I need am I not in the right place if I'm not in the right place lead me to the right place if this ain't the place then maybe Lord you lead me you guide me whatever he says to you do it the promises of God have to do with this life, absolutely. But the promises of God have not only to do with this life, they also have to do with the life to come. You see, there's, is this making sense to you? I don't mean to ramble too much, but we need to understand this. There's a lot of things about Christianity that make no sense if they're, if they're not compared to eternity. You know what I'm saying? The promises of healing and wealth and a, a wealthy and healthy place, that, that makes sense. But things like holiness, purity, the things that Asaph was struggling with, holiness makes no sense if Christianity only has to do with this life. But when you hold it into the light of eternity, then we understand God's command to come out from them and be ye separate, touch no unclean thing. Be a holy people to a holy God. Why? Because when I leave this life, there is a glorious destiny, that, a place that only the holy can go to. So we've got to teach our young people there is an eternity. There is a promise. And the promise has to do with this life and the one to come. But if it's only this or that, is this making sense to you? We're going to lose our young people. Let's continue. Verse 13. Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. Do you know when the enemy will really begin to oppose you? When your calling is clear and your anointing is manifest. When you get sincere about God, the enemy sincerely begins to oppose you. In the life of David, how many of you reading the story of David, you would think that after, after the prophet came and anointed him with oil, that it would have been all good days. But in the life of David, that's when all hell broke loose. David never had problems like he had until after the prophet said, you're the king. Then no one liked him. You want to know why your struggle has been so hard for so long? Because your destiny is so glorious. 
Selah. Think about that one for a moment. It's not because God has abandoned you. It's because God has anointed you. The greatest time, the easiest time to stop the growth of an oak tree is not when it's full grown. When it's a sapling. That's the easiest time to kill it. Asaph says, we give everything and get nothing. We look at people who lie and never get caught. They cheat and get away with it. They don't even try hard, but they get promoted. And as we begin to compare our lives with theirs, you know, and Paul said this many years after. He said, you know, I, Paul said, I'm not going to be like these other preachers. They compare themselves among themselves and tell you how great they are by using other people as their standard. Paul said, that's foolishness. The greatest way for you and I to get off this slippery slope is stop looking at other people. Even in the church. Don't compare what you drive to what they drive. Don't compare where you live to where they live. Don't compare to what you're going through to what they're going through. Because some of us had a, listen, we don't all start in the same place. How many of you ever recognize, and this ain't got nothing to do with skin color. It's got nothing to do with gender. You're looking at poor white trash. Some of you have heard this before. I was dropped off at my grandmother's doorstep with a garbage bag and told to wait until someone opened up the door. We don't all have it easy. Some of us have more to overcome. So maybe I started 10 paces behind you. But baby, I'm coming up behind you. I ain't looking at what you got and saying God did me an injustice. I'm looking at where God has brought me from and say, I, I may not be where you are. But thank God I'm not where I used to be. Because if you knew what God had delivered me from, then you would understand why I praise him the way I praise him. I may not be able to quote what you can quote, but I ain't been in the church as long as you've been in the church. Maybe all I know is Jesus. But at the mention of his name. So I ain't looking at you to compare me. We ought not to be looking at each other because our eyes, the Bible says, looking unto Jesus. He's the author. And he's the finisher. I love that part. Because, see, listen, the people that have opposed you, they don't write the narrative of your life. The people who thought little of you don't have the final say. And you are not who they called you. There's one that has the pen, P-E-N, of destiny in his hand. And he loves you. He adores you. He's committed to you. His name is Jesus, and he died for you. Let him write the narrative of your life. Follow his storyline because the ending, the ending is good, baby. For the Bibles, I know, Jeremiah said, I know the plan. When the days are hard and the nights are even harder because I'm drowning in a sea of silence. I reconcile myself, or should I say, I console myself with this one thought. It ain't over yet. I may be going through the valley. I wish somebody would hear me. I may be going through. See, listen, all of us are going to have seasons of struggle. The Bible never promises you won't have trials. James said, in fact, count it all joy when you encounter various trials. And storms, why? Knowing this, that the trying of your faith will produce a perfection in endurance. You'll overcome each storm as it comes. And when it's gone, you will be stronger than before it came. And you'll face the next one knowing, just like David. When David, we, Larry, wherever you are, we sang the song of Goliath. Before David ever faced Goliath, he faced a lion. He faced a bear. 
And because he killed the lion and he killed the bear, when he faced Goliath, there's a little known Greek word that David used when he faced Goliath. And it was, (laughs) and it means in Greek, you ain't all that. Because I've already killed the lion. I've already killed the bear. Who are you? Are y'all listening to me? See, listen, when you're going through what you're going through, know you're going through it. Don't let your feet slip. Don't leave the church thinking it's going to be easier just because you're living a life unopposed. If you're living a life unopposed, perhaps you're flowing with the wrong crowd. Because, see, there is a crowd that seems like they... Oh, and then the, There is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof, the Bible says, is death. There is a crowd that seems like they got it all together and they ain't never got to pay a price. They ain't living holy. You don't want to see where they end up. There are a people that seem to be downtrodden and despised and beaten down, and they keep standing by faith. You want to see where they're going to end up. And this is where Asaph said, listen, in verse 15, i got to hurry up. My time's already over. But I told you the clock meant nothing. <laughs> Asaph said, listen to this. If I had really spoken this way to others, they would have branded, and I'm changing it, they would have branded me a traitor. You see, one of the great problems of the, uh, in the church is we always got to wear the mask. We can never afford to be honest with each other and just come and say, you know what, I'm struggling. You keep telling me God's going to bless me and I ain't got blessed yet. Because we're so afraid if I admit to you I have doubts, I'm going to be branded a traitor. Uh This is one of the reasons why we call this place Real Life Church. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of the mask. Uh I just want to come in and if if I want to lay before God, I've had people say, I can't believe the pastor laid down. What kind of church are you going to? Uh If I want to dance, it might be ugly, but maybe it's a happy dance. I can't dance like Clee, but I got, I got, I got to do what I do. It's all I can do, but I'm gonna do it. Cause I re- is this okay? I recently heard a song say it ain't about how you move; it's about what moves you. Mm. <laughs> if I had really spoken to this way, they would have thought I was a traitor. So he says in verse 16, I kept it inside. And I tried to understand why the wicked prosper. And that's what almost caused them to leave. He said, what a difficult task it is. Then jump down to verse 17. We'll bring this to an end. He said, then I went into your sanctuary. In a moment of honesty and transparency, Father, I just went to church because I was hurting. And when I was in your sanctuary, I encountered your glory. Because how many of you remember last week's message? It ain't about going to church. It's about being the church. Asaph said, when I got to church, and they were praising an unknown and unseen God. They can't see him, but they're singing to him. He said, then I began to understand eternal things. That you are the God of not the momentary, but the eternal. I began to understand that though those who seem to have everything without you, they have nothing. I think one of the greatest ways to see God is in praise. I finally understood, he said, the destiny of the wicked. I thought I was on a slippery slope, but verse 18, you put them on a slippery path and send them sliding over a cliff to destruction. In an instant, they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. James told us that this life is but a vapor. In an instant, they are destroyed, completely swept away. When you arise, O Lord, you will laugh at their silly ideas because they said you don't hear, you don't know. Lord, you laugh at them as a person laughs at dreams in the morning. Then I realized that my heart was bitter. I was all torn up inside. I was so foolish and ignorant, and I must have seemed like a senseless animal to you. And I love this, yet I still belong to you. You hold my right hand, you guide me with your counsel. 
leading me to a glorious destiny. Whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. And I'm going to jump down to verse 28, and we're closing with this, Cleve. So if you would prepare yourself to come and close us out. Remember, he started out in verse 2, but as for me, my feet almost slipped. Then he comes to verse 28, and he says, but as for me, something had changed in him. And what it was is he beheld the beauty of the Lord and the glory of the temple. And he began to see, God, it's not about the big car. The VCR. It's not about the house on the hill. I, I will rejoice in what you give me. And I'll not put my eyes on other people because I'll look only to you. And when I look to you in the beauty, beauty of your tabernacle, I understand that I have a glorious destiny. And Father, who do I have in heaven? It ain't about the gold streets. Who do I have in heaven but you? And I desire no one on the earth but you, this is the answer. If he be high and lifted up, he will draw all men, young and old, every ethnicity, every financial background, he will draw all men to him because collectively then we all the church and we come together and we worship him in that, listen, the, that, that, when the church gathers, his glory manifests. And when his glory manifests, every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl will see him. And to see him is to adore him. To adore him is to be drawn to him. And our destiny then is we will be blessed on the earth. And won't we be happy over there, over there. Oh, won't we be happy over there. Amen? Yeah. Everyone say, no more, no more. Slippery, slope. slippery slope. For he has put my feet on a firm foundation. I'll not look to the left. I'll not look to the right. I will only look to Jesus. Thank you for watching today. For donation of any amount, we would like to offer you an audio CD of today's message in its entirety. Just contact us here at Real Life Church using the information that is on your screen. For donation of any amount, an audio CD of today's message in its entirety. Just contact us here at Real Life Church.